Some of you may be aware that I am a combination of an elected official and a graduate professor where I either keep my students captivated or confined for two hours and 45 minutes. That's a dangerous combination because it uh, leads to long-windedness and so therefore I'm a victim of diarrhea at the mouth, uh, dripping tongue, and motor mouth. And so I'm going to try to stay within. I've wasted 30 seconds already within my uh, eight uh, minutes. Um, my paper, uh, my uh, presentation is an outcome of a paper that I presented at the National Council of Professors of Educational Leadership. And months later, they asked me to develop it into a book, so I'll share with you uh, my book. It's called Creating Excellence, Becoming a A-plus School. The first chapter deals with, with change and the demand for change. Change is, uh, is in vogue in education. Unfortunately, there are too many practitioners who don't see the need to change. And if you don't see the need to change, you're not going to change. Change comes through two methods, through internal dissatisfaction or external agitation. And there's a lot of external education in this education reform period. The testing craze, all the things that the legislatures are doing across these United States are creating the demand for change. But if you don't get people to a point where they want to change, where they see the need to change, then you're going to continue to do the same and get the same results. Chapter two deals with the philosophy of education. Every educator, every practitioner has a philosophy. Unfortunately, it may not be positive about education. There are educators out there who believe that minorities can't learn as well as the majority. There are those who believe that teachers, that, that the girls are smarter than boys, or boys are smarter than girls, or children of poverty can't learn, and they're functioning in our schools. So it's important that we bring all of our faculty together with a common, wholesome philosophy of education if you're going to have a school of excellence. Chapter three deals with the vision. A vision is an ideal picture of a future state of your school. It is based on your philosophy and your beliefs. That's where you get your vision. It is the responsibility of the educational leader to, to conceptualize a vision for the school. And there's many ways you can do that. And, and then you must reduce that vision, which is conceptual, into a, a vision statement. And it has to be communicated among all stakeholders. Everybody has to buy into the vision if you're going to get there. Unfortunately, we don't do a good job of shepherding the vision so that we, we, we come up with the vision just to be able to uh, say we have one, but we don't shepherd it to become reality. Chapter four deals with climate and culture. <laughs> climate is uh, divided into two domains. It's physical and it's emotional, and you've got to address both of those domains of the climate. And you work on the climate in your school in order to get a good culture. Culture is what you don't see many times. Climate is what the feeling you have when you're in a building at a certain time. And so it's important that we address climate because climate is where you plant the instructional seeds and you're gonna get a greater yield if you have a good climate within your school. And so this picture here shows uh, how complicated culture is. There are things that you see in culture and you, you're aware of, but there's so many things that are hidden like an iceberg underneath the water. And those persons who are effective in being strong educational leaders do a great job of analyzing, dissecting, and developing a good school culture. Uh, the chapter concludes by discussing the principal's role in creating a school culture and talk about methodology of, of doing that. Uh, you've got to work on the climate daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly to create a culture of excellence. Chapter five deals with the recruitment and development of, of staff. If first of all, a, a wise educational leader needs to go out and, and, and get the best. You need to spend a lot of time in the recruitment and principals must have an involvement in the recruitment process. It should not be done solely at the central level. And we want to go out and select the best. But even uh, the best wood cutter takes time to sharpen 
his acts. And because of that, you have to have professional development, and it has to be ongoing, and it has to be meaningful, and it has to be based on the needs of your student population as well as your faculty. Classroom observations are very important, and many times we don't spend enough time getting into the classroom where the action is. Chapter 6 deals with rigor and high expectations, why we need rigor, why do we uh, have to have high expectations for children. It is not uh, uh, the words that we speak, it's the behavior that you present. And it talks about higher order thinking and recommendations for practicing principles, and time is going too fast. Chapter 7 is dealing with engaging parents for school success. In the first generation of effective schools research, they said nothing about the involvement of the parents and the community. In the second generation of effective school research, they came out and they said, you, we can't successfully educate these kids unless we involve the parents and the community in it. I served 20 years as a practice principal, and the thing that I'm most proud of is how I engaged my parents, all stakeholders, in the quest for academic excellence. Chapter 8 deals with persistence and drive. Never giving up. The battle's not over till you quit. You know, that little knucklehead child quits on himself, but the educator cannot quit on that child. The battle's not over until both parties quit. So we talk about how you deal with union negotiations and overcome them, how you deal with resistance and so forth, and I'm skipping past this because time's almost up. Now, I want to share with you, I'm a Christian, and I know about the Beatitudes, and so I wrote Beatitudes to close out this book for principles, and it deals with all the concepts of having the book. It says, blessed are the principles who are willing to make a difference in their uh, and for there, is, uh, for there is a school of excellence. Blessed is the principal who serves as a change agent for difficult teachers, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are principals who treat all teachers with dignity and respect as during the change as during the pro change process, so they shall inherit an A-plus school. Blessed are the principals who hunger, uh, I'm rushing too much, and thirst for excellence, communicate and shepherd in the school's vision, for they shall achieve it and be satisfied. Blessed are principals who are merciful and fair in their leadership style, not harassing, threatening, imitating, or humiliating, for they shall obtain a collegial and collaborative staff. And finally, blessed are principals who are pure and genuine in the efforts, guiding and challenging all stakeholders, for they shall see their students achieve. Thank you.